Yeah, so time for something a little bit different. Uh, this summer, I had the pleasure of working in the Science Activation Program uh, funded by NASA, specifically on the Exploration Science Through Shadows project. I worked with Fisk Planetarium and the American Museum of Natural History to pr produce uh, an implementation for stellar occultations into the visualization platform OpenSpace. So that was a lot, but I'll go into it all. First of all, what in the world is a stellar occultation? At its most basic form, it's when an object passes in front of a star. When that object passes in front of a star, there is a period or there is an area behind the object that is in shadow, where the light from that star is emitted, dimmed, or completely blocked off. The most relevant example for us is a solar eclipse. When the moon passes in front of the sun, the relative sizes and distances means that there is an area on Earth that is almost completely blocked off from seeing the sun. There is essentially a beam of darkness that passes over our Earth. This is extremely applicable for a lot of objects in our solar system, like asteroids, comets, and even planets, because when they pass across different stars, we can learn a lot about how they orbit around the sun without having to rely on spaceship, spacecraft visitation or rovers or other more intensive direct visitation, we can actually stay on Earth and observe how they occult distant stars and learn a lot about them from that. Uh, this small image here is exactly that. It is what we would see from Earth. We see a dark object passing in front of a distant, very dim object. And we can actually see the light from that object cut out as an object passes in front of it. So what exactly have, I, have we done? Well, we focused on implementing this area of shadow. To do so, we use what is called a renderable shadow cylinder, which is an object in open space, our desired visualization software. Effectively, it draws a line from the star that we chose, or really any light source, through the object, past it into however much space we want. So as you can see, this image here is the 2017 solar eclipse. We can see briefly that there is a beam of shadow passing across the Earth as it would in real life. This is a direct simulation of what happened around five years ago. This was created using what is called the NASA SPY system, which is a standardization of orbit data and rotational parameters and shape models that NASA uses to effectively back up a lot of their missions. It is a standardized information, open uh, standardized information format. Open space is kind of built on these spice kernels. So what I've done is effectively standardize a way to take spice kernels for a desired star and object and run it through some Jupyter notebooks such that it creates this shadow when we load it into open space. So effectively, we have a framework for introducing any occultation that we want into open space. And as you can see here, it works great in our solar system. However, when we attempted to test this methodology for uh, a very distant star, anywhere from 100 to 2,000 light years away, we see that there is a degree of inaccuracy. Uh, the bottom image here is the modeled shadow path for a occultation of Arakoth. Arakoth is a asteroid about the same distance away from the sun as Pluto. And here it is being lit from a star that's about 200 light years away. Now, this is an observed occultation event that occurred in 2017 that should have passed over the southern hemisphere, specifically over the southern part of uh, South America. In 2017, we actually observed it happen. However, when we attempted to replicate this using our framework in open space, we see that is about 10 to 50,000 kilometers away from our target area. What this means is there is something in how we are representing these occultations that is inaccurate, that is not scientifically accurate enough to get the results that we want when simulated. Uh, this could have to do with our data. We were pulling data from the most publicly available source that we could get, which was the JPL Horizon system. Uh, we hope by using more mission-ready spice kernels, ones that are significantly more updated and in use for missions like Lucy, we will be able to actually accurately simulate these occultations. If we are able to, 
This will be a very valuable asset for creating planetarium films, educational uh, demonstrations, gifts, and mm, a lot of materials for curriculum that can be used to teach people about how stellar occultations work and how they can be used in our communities and around the world to examine a lot of the bodies that are still unobserved in our solar system. Thank you so much for everyone who's helping for this project. And it's been wonderful to be back in recess for another year. Thank you, that was great. So the floor is open for questions. You can raise your hand, you can put it in the chat. Okay, I have a question. This is pretty different than what you did in 2020. Very different. To say that lightly. <laughs> um, what was something that drew you to this project? So for those of you who are aware, so in their second year recess, um, students can seek out their own project mentors. So Ben sought this project out. So what's yeah. something that drew, drew you to this? Well, I think a lot of it was, I kind of always have wanted to do space science and get involved with space science. So when I did this internship a couple of years ago, you know, I was just trying to test the water, see what I liked. And I liked a lot of the more modeling, uh, coding aspects of the project. And I wanted to apply stats to some sort of science education, which I've been kind of had a growing passion for over the past couple of years. So I reached out to a couple of people uh, at CU Boulder, Specifically, my mentor for this project was uh, Dr. John Keller, who's the director of Fisk Planetarium. Uh, he kind of proposed a general framework for this project. And we talked about uh, Exploration Science of the Shadows, which is the NASA grant that we're working under. And it just kind of all came together. But it was really like that modeling and coding that I got to do two years ago that really made me want to do this project. Thank you for sharing. Enrique has a question. Um, he says, do you think the 10 or 50K offset could have to do with the earth mapping projection used in the modeling software? So I would likely, I would say likely no, mostly because the earth has such an intensely well-known orbit. Like the earth is kind of the orbit that we build all of our observations on for pretty much everything. So it is really the most known orbit. So it is much more likely that just one asteroid out of the hundreds of thousands that exist in the universe has a slightly less good <laughs> observation or available data than the Earth. So probably not, but it's technically possible, but that would be a significantly larger overhaul of what we already are, what we are already doing. Uh, you are muted, Anika. I knew I saw the alert as soon as I did it. Um, <laughs> Zuli, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, simple, simple question. Um, hi, Ben. Hi, um, Lily. <laughs> so what was your favorite part of this project? I don't know. It's just doing something that's so different than anything I've done before. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the work that I, I think it was also just kind of trying to, a lot of what Recess works on is more traditional research formats and advice for that. So it was really, a great opportunity for me to like examine what works for traditional research and what could work for me and seeing which parts of that actually like would help or would hinder or would benefit me as a scientist or would benefit me as an educator, or benefit me as a researcher. So a lot of that kind of interplay between traditional research and more education focused research was really interesting for me and a really cool experience. Cool, thank you. <laughs> awesome, great talk. I think we have time for one more question, but there's a few in the chat. Uh, I Patrick would like to them. know, <laughs> is this modeling likely to be used to predict shadows based on upcoming events or to demonstrate what has happened on past events from so, our perspective on Earth? So that's a good question. I mean, the goal, so this is what I didn't mention because it's kind of still being worked out, is this is part of a three-year grant. So there will be several more RU students after me hopefully taking on parts of this project. But the goal would be to use it as a predictive software uh, in more sense of like, not exactly predicting it, but more in sense of like being able to visualize future events. Uh, the reasoning being a lot of the predictions that people make for predicting actual occultations that will occur are based on spice kernels. So 
they have their programs for running spice kernels through to see where or if when an asteroid will cause an occultation. So if we were able to get access to these spice kernels, it should be pretty much a one-to-one -one visualization to what they're getting for their predictions. Uh, however, as of now, it is more likely to be used for visualizing past events simply because they we know more accurately how they happened. So it'd be a lot more easy to tell whether or not that our visualization is actually accurate. 